Okay. Well, you're probably going to talk this direction. I would very much like to thank uh, the organizers of inviting me here. It's a very uh, impressive audience. Um, I'm also very happy that um, a small article of mine was included in this, this book, which I'm also happy about. Uh, I'm very sorry that I cannot really speak Italian, so I have uh, really to speak in English and also discuss in English. Um, what I would like to, to present to you is this uh, small kind of an, an overview about uh, discussions about digital evolution and big data and uh, as a kind of an input for our discussions that we have afterwards. And um, I don't know whether you can see it from, might be a bit difficult. Okay, you, you can see it. <laughs> okay, we'll see. <laughs> we will manage. The technology seems to be overwhelming. Okay, we have in operating the issues, uh, human machine interface. <laughs> <laughs> now I think uh, what I'm starting with fits very well um, what um, uh, has been said before. What we have to understand is that the digital revolution, and I would like to call it really a revolution, is really a Schubiterian revolution in the sense it's disruptive and it's leading to a technological economic and also social evolution. And it's really creative destruction of old markets, old industry through new markets, new industries. <coughs> and it's, but it's also changing how the entire economy is working and also how the entire society is working. So it's really a big issue. You all know the new business models and tech companies, Google, search engines, Facebook, the social media, and other platforms, Amazon, etc. But the new uh, a really new uh, aspect is now data as a critical resource. That's with big data, but big data is not only about data, it's also about data analytics and what we do with the result of data analytics and then we have the discussion about algorithms. And it's always related to what we call data-driven innovation. And these data are still getting more important in the future through the Internet of Things, which is right now starting everywhere smart homes, but also connected driving or later autonomous driving, smart manufacturing in regard to the manufacturing industry with informationally integrated value chains. <coughs> and this transition of this old traditional economy to a digital economy requires now a broad adaptation of the entire legal and regulatory framework. For on one hand, allowing to exploit really the benefits and opportunities of this digital revolution, but on the other hand, also to deal with the many, also still unknown problems and dangers of the digital revolution. And we know dangers are in regard to competition, are, are to privacy, and we have many other kind of questions. For example, the question of robots, whether they're replacing human labor, etc. So there are many other questions uh, that we have to deal with. The European Union is doing a lot uh, discussing uh, about the future legal framework for digital economy. So as a digital single market strategy, have a lot of specific initiatives. Uh, you know, the, um, for example, right now there is a discussion about the e-privacy regulation and uh, it's a very controversial discussion. From an economic perspective, regulatory challenges are because usually we say we have a specific problem of market failure and that we have a specific regulation for addressing this market failure. 
And now the digital revolution means that on one hand we might have entirely new market players, on the other hand there might also be old market players that perhaps vanish and we don't need the regulations anymore or that regulations have to change because what's now the best regulatory solution might be a different one than before because of the new technology possibilities. And I think also that the digital revolution is a systemic <coughs> innovation, meaning that uh, it also requires an integrated, well-coordinated adaptation of different regulatory policies. Now you can see here So the regulatory policies we are talking about is on one hand competition law, competition policy, then certainly privacy, data protection law, but also consumer law, and then on the other side also IP law, and a new discussion we have right now about data ownership and rights on data, which is a property rights aspect on data, and many other regulations that we have and that are important here. The so first one I would like to discuss is a little bit about competition law. So what I'm doing here is a bit summarizing what we're discussing right now. So this is nothing new. The so one is really is a well-known competition problems uh, on platform markets. So we know platform markets have large direct and direct network effects with so this tendency to a net of a monopoly. And this is still an unsolved problem, especially because um, collected data also uh, play a role here. And we know that platforms as Google and Facebook seem to be quasi-monopolistic. And we, we do not really know how we should deal with this. And we have others as Amazon and Apple where we think this has considerable market power, but we also have problems how we deal with this and categorize this from a competition law perspective. <coughs> Possible solutions that are um, discussed in regard to this weak competition between platforms on one hand, with the accumulated data <coughs> that we see in the essential facility, with perhaps access solutions, perhaps the radical solution, or the data portability issue which comes from data protection law and which also might perhaps help um, competition among platforms through uh, reducing switching costs. Now if you look at the specific pillars of competition law, on the hand, abuse of dominance. We can talk about exploited abuse if there are too many uh, data collected as a kind of a price abuse, yeah, and there's not enough private privacy protection. And the other aspect where you can use Article 102 is um, if you are uh, see refusing access to data under certain conditions as abusive uh, behavior. In the of merger policy, um, the point is that what is really the question is how can market power emerge through data and how we are dealing with this. And this also is not a clear issue so far. So the question is how we can take into account data in that respect in merger cases, but also perhaps the capabilities of data analytics, because it's not only about data. Yeah? And the other question is always how we define markets, and this is uh, especially difficult in regard to data in merger cases. So the one question is always horizontally, um, whether there is a monopolizing or too large concentration of data, especially specific data, or vertically about the access of firms on up and down stream markets to essential data. And these are issues uh, that are being discussed right now. In the Gado Cat House, we can talk about collusion, and there are two discussions. So one is really <coughs> about whether a certain kind of data sharing between firms has to be seen as information sharing agreements which might alleviate and facilitate really price collusion especially our hub and spoke <coughs> aspect, hub and spoke uh, cat house. And the other discussion we have gotten uh, recently is whether price setting algorithms might lead to price collusion. And this is also very interesting and very hard to analyze on an economic perspective uh, topic. The other question we can also talk about is uh, cat house in regard to data, data pools. So as we have talent pools, we can also talk about data pools. And one interesting question is also whether there is a collusion about technical data solutions. This is also, I think, an interesting uh, future topic. One specific problem competition law has, and also competition economics has, is that we usually focus entirely on the effects on specific markets only. 
And we are not good at really looking beyond specific markets. That's exactly the problems we have right now with the digital economy, is that many effects are beyond specific markets. And this is something uh, where we as economists have problems, and you as lawyers also have problems to deal with this in competition law. <coughs> Then my second perspective is now consumer and data protection problems. And um, you know that consumer policy, from an economic perspective, is always about the market failure in regard to information and behavioral problems or rationality problems. Data protection is on one hand different because data protection is really about protecting privacy as a fundamental value which is always a bit difficult for economists to deal with this because they're afraid of too efficiency. But I think it's very important uh, seeing privacy as a fundamental value. But what we have in data protection is consent principle about processing using your personal data. And if you look what the real problems in are, then we have in data protection rather similar problems to consumer protection concerns, exactly about information problems and behavioral problems. And this is then the discussion that we have also among contract lawyers about data, data as counter performance for free services. And the question is, do these markets work? Do they really work? And can users fulfill their privacy preferences? This is how I would put it as an economist. And I'm very skeptical about this, because what we see is that there's often no choice between using a service with and without collection of personal data, and also not enough choice between sufficient privacy options. This is what we see empirically, and I think this is a problem. Yeah, also from an economic perspective. Now, this is also directly related to what we know for a long time, the social privacy paradox. Uh, we know that internet users are on one hand concerned about privacy, and say this is very important to them. On the other hand, that we are looking what they're really doing, then we are seeing they behave very differently and they are very generous and do not really be cautious in regard to the data. So the question is how do we how do we interpret this kind of behavior? Do people not care? But we can see, and there's a lot of empirical studies about this, that in this regard uh, people have a lot of behavioral problems, especially because there is a huge uncertainty about potentially harmful effects. Nobody knows what what firms are in the future doing with data you are giving now. Yeah, so there's entirely uncertainty about this, not, not only in transparency, also uncertainty about this. And therefore it's very hard to make any kind of rational decisions about this. Yeah? And the problem is also the other problem we know very well, private policies are intransparent, too long, incomprehensible, and also I never read them. And this also leads to a very important question, and a difficult question is that right now we have in data protection law really this idea that every, uh, that the main pillar is really notice and consent solutions. So you inform people and they are consenting. And the question is whether this really works as a basic approach. And the first thing is not clear what informed <coughs> consent really means, yeah, legally and economically. And uh, we got an increasingly critical discussion whether it's possible at all to rely on individual consent as a fundamental barrier, or whether we need different kind of uh, really solutions. Yeah? And this problem will increase dramatically with more IoT contexts, with more IoT uh, applications, because then you have the sensors everywhere in the, on in the offline world. Everywhere you are, there will be sensors who are really uh, generating data about you. Yeah? And what then uh, consent, consent means is not clear anymore. Yes. Now what can be done? So the traditional solutions are always more information requirements, privacy by design, privacy by default. I think this might help, but only to some extent. Yeah, you can talk about minimum standards for transparency, more privacy options. Perhaps it's interesting really to see whether it will be successful to implement an effective system of data productivity. So this is a very different approach also. <coughs> but what I think is also important to see is the interrelationship between competition and data protection. And that's exactly that we have to look from both sides on this. I think if it would be a succeed to having more competition, better competition among platforms, 
then also we might get better data protection because there might be a competition for privacy uh, friendly solutions and less data protection. And if we could would get better data protection, then we might get more competition, for example, through data portability. So these are interrelated and there is an interplay between both policies. This we have to understand. My third uh, field is now this new topic of data ownership, data economy, rights on data, data trading, um, access to data, which is a very recent discussion. Um, and this has two aspects. One is about non-personal data or industrial data, and the other is about personal data. I look at non-personal data. This is uh, based you know, on this new communication of the European Union, uh, building a European data economy from the January of this year. Um, the basic concern of the Commission is that many firms have collected and produced a lot of data, but they are only using it in-house for themselves and do not share them and do not really trade them, and therefore these data are not used enough. <coughs> and since data is a non rival good from an economic perspective, data should be used as much as possible. So this is a problem. Um, <coughs> The, communica the communication makes two uh, main kind of, of proposals. The one is introducing a data producer right, which is a kind of a new IP-like right for non-personal data. Um, and the other is uh, discussing <coughs> access rights, so quite the opposite, rights to access private health data for ensuring more competition and enabling more innovation uh, because you need for competition and innovation for market entering sometimes access to data. And this is uh, the argument. If you look at this from an economic perspective, and this is what I've uh, worked on all this year, is um, I think a new exclusive property right on data cannot be recommended because there is not really a clear market failure that so this solved. So there's no need for it. And I think it's more dangerous uh, for innovation because it might innovate. Um, might impede innovation, especially in big data context, where we need access to many data. But rights to access certain privately held data, there might be, I think, uh, under certain conditions, there might be good economic reasons why we don't <coughs> think about this to introduce this. Um, but this has to be analyzed very carefully and more sector specific uh, for finding good solutions. In any case, what we need is. Uh, looking more on data trading and the problems of data trading because data trading does not work so far very well, but it does not seem that lacking property rights are the problem. There are the problems. Now to personal data. We all know that GDPR um, comes into force next year with strong rights or radically strong rights for protecting personal data. But I think many questions, so far I've understood, many questions remain how the specific rules will really look like and how they will be applied. And we see right now the discussion about the e-privacy regulation. There are many open questions. From a regulatory perspective, it's very interesting because on the one hand, um, you have a trade-off between really the privacy of individual persons, of the privacy of all of us as persons, yeah, so they want to keep certain data private. And that there is an economy out there and there's a state out there who could make a good benefit, can have good benefits from our data. And there are, there are conflicts, very basic conflicts um, between this privacy protection in the persons and the huge advantages for the economy. Also in respect of international competitiveness of European firms, also they have also this industry policy perspective the state for improving public policies and also scientific research. And it's not clear how these trade-offs are really will be solved politically in the future. I'm a bit worried as a not as economist, as a private person, that privacy might also be on the losing side in this kind of uh, discussion. <coughs> now, the discussions about the concrete scope of privacy protection um, what are, where do we draw the lines? And I think one thing is um, for which uses of personal data is explicit consent necessary and where is it not necessary? So in that respect, in, in the GDPR, I have understood there is also possibilities of uh, balancing interests 
when you need consent and why not, and also um, other possibilities. Um, there's a discussion on the e-privacy regulation about metadata of communication, for example, whether you need consent or not for certain kind of things. Um, and if content is necessary, then in what form? Opt in, opt out, privacy by default, or not? These are all possibilities how you can change the, the line between privacy and the data economy. And the other question is, um, what I also have learned about anonymization, which is usually seen as a solution to everything, but we also know that um, it's not clear whether anonymization is working because data scientists talk all about that you can re-identify and it's also a question of degree, so it's about the degree of anonymization and where it draws the line here. So I think these are the very interesting questions and trade-offs that have to be decided. Now all of this is getting more difficult through the Internet of Things and um, I also uh, was on a conference in, in, uh, in June in Brussels about Internet of Things uh, and what I learned also here is um, we have so many unsolved regulatory challenges in the kind of things. Um, security issues, liability issues, then the whole question of interoperability, because you would like to connect everything, then so you need have to have standards. All of this does not exist really. We have the privacy data protection issues, what means consent with your smart TV, <laughs> for example. And then who is owning the data? Who has control about the data, about what kind of data, and who gets the benefits of that? All these things are not clear and open questions. Yeah? And I found very interesting, I read uh, yesterday that the German uh, Bundeskartellamt has initiated a sector inquiry on personal data in the regard of smart TVs for exactly analyzing contracts with, of, of TV manufacturers, what contracts they have uh, with, the, uh, with the buyers and analyzing this because they have things there is a problem with that. Now one important example on which I am working on right now is data governance in connected cars. So data in the so-called in-vehicle data. This is very interesting, very complex, but this is already existing. So we already have connected cars um, and there's a new policy discussion about this. Um, the current model is what car manufacturers are doing is a so-called extended vehicle concept, which is also the model of the car manufacturers of association. Um, and this would mean that all data of the sensors and about driving behavior, whatever, go directly to the server of a car manufacturer and they have exclusive control about this. This is what's happening right now. The question is, is this the right way? And the problem is on one hand, again, privacy consent of car drivers and, and uh, car owners. And the other problem is, and this is a competition problem, is about access to illegal uh, <coughs> data for independent service providers, repair services, maintenance service providers, but also many other service providers who want to provide services to the car passengers and have to go have access to the car. Should we have regulated access rights in regard to this? This is exactly uh, what will be the discussion. And there's also discussion about um, what are the right technical solutions. So should business the exit legal concept or there are other technical solutions on board uh, application system platform, which is a different technical solution. But the point is that implementing a different technical solution also means that different stakeholders have control about the data. So the technical solutions lead to different data governance solutions. And that was this important how the technical solutions are. Okay, my last <coughs> very brief slide. I think it is still very unclear what the appropriate legal framework for the digital economy is. It's a fascinating topic, but it's also scary. Scary also because of we really don't know what will happen. This is really innovation with all the problems of innovation, also in the kind of uncertainty. We don't know what will happen in the next 10 years, but we have to react on this and we have to develop solutions. And I think there will be many adaptations necessary. The Internet of Things will increase these regulatory challenges significantly in comparison to what we have today. And what is important, and I think this has already mentioned, uh, it will not help if scholars and policymakers in each regulatory field try to find suitable solutions separately. So we really have to work together. What we need is 
the analysis of the interplay between the regular policies and trying to find a more integrated approach to that. Yeah, and therefore I think it's important to have a well-coordinated adaptation and a well-coordinated also application of regulatory policies and collaboration of the regulatory authorities. And I have understood this, what we are doing here today exactly in this kind of basic idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kerber, for this uh, fascinating presentation. I think you're perfectly right. Uh, you, you did mention something which is present in the written version of your paper, that is the Schumpeterian nature of this uh, change. Uh, it's really uh, the archetype of the Schumpeterian uh, innovation that is the creative disruption. And we are, uh, we are mulling over the disruption. Um, and I fully agree with you that the only way to face these problems is to join forces in uh, interdisciplinary approach. Um, Thank you also for being an economist. I feel lonely sometimes. <laughs> uh,